So our next, next speaker is William Pearson, most of him knows by Bill Pearson, and he's at the Department of Biochemistry at the University of Virginia, Charlottesville in USA, and basically everyone knows him because uh, I would say he's a very fast man. I mean, thanks to the Fastly package, you know, so many people have been doing discovery, and I would say it's before Fastly with Fast P and Fast N. So, I mean, dating back to so publication from 85, but what I learned from Bill is that the first version were written in 83. So it's 23 years of that uh, this package exists, and more than 20 years that people have been using it on a regular basis. And I think it's fair to say that Bill has not written this package just to make a software package to give it to the community, but because he was interested in using it himself for his long-standing interest in the evolution of protein. I mean, it's, uh, I mean, it's not making a package. As a, it's a tool became, in a way, I mean, it's, uh, uh, I mean uh, it was used for his research in protein evolution. As geolinks, I put Charlottesville, where you have been for a long period now, but uh, you studied in Urbana Champagne, and Pasadena, in Corona del Mar, in Baltimore. There's a lot of people with whom you have written, but I put two people which are in the field of bioinformatics that people recognize, who is David Lipman and Glenn Miller. And two small last things, uh, dating back from prehistory, 87, uh, sorry, 88. I mean, uh, Bill was in contact with me to get copies of SwissProt, and then he exchanged back by sending floppy disk of uh, Fasti. And as you see at the time, you, I mean, even so, such a bitnet where you can send by email, so the fastest way to do that was shipping, you know, either tape or so that was great. We could do 1.2 mega, you know, megabase floppy disk. So we regularly exchange copy of SwissProt on floppy disk, and I received in return a further and further version of FASTP for a number of years until it was, of course, easier to do it by FTP. And, and to speak about protein evolution, one last small uh, email. Uh, Bill also sent error report on SwissProt entry, and uh, one year later he sent us an entry. Uh, it was an HMG, uh, non histone chromosomal protein from salmon, which seemed to be contaminated with a piece of glutathione transferase. And glutathione transferase evolution, the family uh, evolution of glutathione transferase has been a long standing interest from Bill. So I was happy to see that he had sent an update, and just for the short, making it short, it was, in fact, what he was saying, I think you have exon shuffling taking place in your library entry. It was more or less right, basically, it was the two embed entry had been uh, mixed together, and there was half of a region for an HMG protein and half of a glutathione transferase which had been glued together into nucleotide sequence entry. So I will stop here and thank Bill for having come. Well, it's, uh, it's a great uh, honor to be here uh, this meeting. I've really enjoyed the talks. I don't often get a chance to actually talk to people who have some clue as to what I do. So uh, this is a special opportunity for me. Um, so what I'm going to talk about this morning is um, sort of uh, different from uh, lots of the ways that people think about using protein sequences. Uh, in addition to, to developing methods for doing rapid sequence similarity searching or more sensitive similarity searching, more recently, I've come to start thinking about what it means that we're actually able to do sequence similarity searching as reliably as we can, and what that tells us about, um, not just about the sequences that are in the, the database or the sequences that are in um, organisms, but the sequences that could have been. So um, I was certainly very struck by Amos's uh, comment or calculation at the beginning of the meeting that there were somewhere around 179 billion proteins that might end up in Swiss code at some point. But, um, of course, that's actually a very small number compared to the number of possible proteins. And so I wonder, actually, if there are only 179 billion proteins that would have a function and fold, and if there are only 179 billion proteins here, 
then how many could there be everywhere? So um, after a, a quick uh, talk about the history of sequence comparison, I'm sort of coming from Des Higgins' perspective here. So what got me interested in sequence comparison was a paper by uh, David Lippmann and, and uh, John Wilbur back in, um, it was actually published in February of 1983. That started my collaboration with David Lippmann. So in the summer of 1983, we got together and thought about better methods for comparing protein sequences because this method was actually best for um, comparing DNA sequences. And um, in the fall of 1983, we wrote the FASTP program, and which was published a couple of years later. And then, of course, since then, um, there's this other program that people use a lot. Uh, um, so uh, one of the things that's not, I think, generally appreciated about uh, protein evolution is that um, things started extremely quickly or early. And, and I'm going to argue in this talk that, that the fact that they started so early also suggests that they, could, they can happen quickly. And I see no reason to believe that they've actually stopped happening, that new protein families, new protein folds are not uh, still emerging. So here's a, a, a brief history of the universe, or actually of, of the Earth. So the Earth is thought to be about four and a half million years old. And the thing which is um, not widely appreciated is that there wasn't actually liquid water on Earth until about 4.2 billion years ago. And we think that um, the first life, protein-based life on Earth, emerged about 600 million years later. And um, shortly after that, basically, most of the things that we think about as being necessary for a modern organism existed. So in a mere 600 million years or so, um, large numbers of families of proteins, lots of different kinds of protein folds managed to emerge. And of course, they've been going on for the last um, three and a half, three uh, billion years to get to where we are today. So, do that. so I also, <laughs> thinking historically, of course, uh, sequence comparison has moved pretty quickly as well. Um, uh, Needleman Wunsch wrote their paper in 1970, but I don't think the method was actually very widely used, at least on a computer. I think perhaps people did it by hand. The first sequence comparison program that I'm familiar with that was being run on computers a lot was actually written by Corn, Queen, and Wegman in 1977. And that was mostly um, used for DNA sequences because in 1977, the only publicly accessible DNA uh, database, sequence databases, were DNA databases. Uh, Smith and Waterman wrote their paper in 1981 but again, um, there was not an implementation of this program which was sufficiently uh, efficient that allowed people to actually use it. So there, are, there were groups that used Smith and Waterman in the early 80s, but they tended to have uh, VAX computers, and they would run them literally for days simply to do a single database search on a database of a few thousand proteins. So that changed with Wilbur and Lippmann's uh, search N program and then with the FASTP program, and which then uh, changed into the FASTA program by 1988. And it's sort of interesting that um, you know, certainly BLAST has changed our ability to do similarity searching mostly because of the um, effectiveness of the statistics that were developed, also because of the ease of use of the program through the web. Um, and SciBlast has certainly taken that up another step as far as uh, being able to do more sensitive searches. Um, and today we can actually do um, searches with the Smith-Waterman algorithm about as fast as you can do searches with FASTA, we have some vectorized versions of the program. So what I'm going to talk about in the science part of the talk is, is uh, first of all, I want to, to, to spend a little time pointing out that when one says that uh, sequences have an expectation value of 10 to the minus 6th or 10 to the minus 5th, the odds of seeing that level of similarity by chance are 1 in 1,000 or 1 in a million, those estimates are extremely accurate. Um, they're certainly widely used for doing uh, ant genome annotation. Um, they're widely accepted if misunderstood. But it's, I think, worthwhile to think about why do they work so well, and not only what does that tell us about our ability to interpret similarity results, but also what does that tell us about the protein universe in general. So I'm first of all going to talk about uh, similarity statistics for a little bit. And then we're going to ask the question whether or not those same kinds of statistical estimates or statistical uh, sort of processes can be applied to structure comparison. Because, of course, structure comparison is the gold standard that we use for deciding whether or not it's likely that proteins are homologous. If they have excess structural similarity, then that's what we infer. 
but unfortunately, the statistical estimates for structure comparisons are not nearly as accurate as they are for sequence comparison. And then the third thing I'm going to talk about is sort of a, 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 a little more vague, perhaps, whether or not uh, protein folding is difficult. So I'm going to show you a couple of examples. You've heard about one of them a couple times already at this meeting, about the fact that similar functions, almost identical functions, can emerge multiple times in nature, which to me suggests at least that protein folding is not as hard as we thought. And then the other question I'm going to uh, talk about for just a little bit is whether or not protein sequences are random. So um, I have to always show this slide. This is a slide from a Margaret Dayhoff a paper in the Atlas of Protein Sequence and Structure from about 1975, um, where she talks about, this is a, of course an evolutionary tree, but I use it to talk about the, how we infer homology, because I think that it's really, people do blast searches every day, thousands and thousands, they look at statistical significance estimates, they use the term homology, but oftentimes they don't really think about what it means. So when we do a similarity search, for example, with a human protein, and we find a statistically significant match with a yeast protein, the inference that we're making is that that protein existed in an organism that lived more than um, a billion years ago, which was the ancestor of uh, yeast and mammals, and was apparently sufficiently well whoops, conserved that um, we're still able to recognize um, the excess similarity between the yeast protein and the human protein after 1.2 billion years. Likewise, when you find a match between a human protein and an E. coli protein, sorry, um, you're now talking about the presence of that protein in an organism that lived more than two and a half billion years ago. That again was and th th that protein in that organism changed sufficiently slowly that we can still recognize its um, its uh, common ancestry because of the excess sequence similarity. And the thing which is remarkable is that there are lots of proteins that have incredible excess sequence similarity. So what I'm showing you here is a table that came from, what we took all of the um, E. coli proteins and compared them against the human uh, proteins uh, on one of the early human genome builds. And these are simply the, the sequences that share the strongest amount of sequence similarity. So there's a, an E. coli glycine decarboxylase, which is clearly homologous to a human glycine decarbox dehydrogenase. And uh, the expectation value here is 10 to the minus 200th. These two sequences are more than 50% identical over more than 900 amino acids. And we have a whole list of, of, of numbers here that are spectacularly small. The odds of these things happening by chance are spectacularly low, um, mostly because they're very well conserved over very long regions. And in fact, about 30% of the proteins in E. coli share statistically significant similarity with proteins in humans which is not to say that only 30% of the proteins in E. coli are homologous to human proteins, but that at least 30% of the proteins still have enough similarity that despite the fact that they last shared a common ancestor more than two and a half billion years ago, we can detect that similarity. So, it's sort of, un it makes me uncomfortable when I give this talk and talk about the fact that we're saying things that, about proteins that lived in organisms two and a half billion years ago. So I'd like to be very clear as to why we make those kinds of inferences. How is it that we can say in any scientific fashion that something lived in an organism that, that, that last existed two and a half billion years ago? Well, the argument for inferring homology is essentially um, an argument um, from parsimony, and let me go through it very quickly. So here are a set of uh, trypsin-like serine proteases, bovine trypsin-like serine proteases. So here's bovine trypsin. Escherichia trypsin and Escherichia protease A, and down at the bottom here are some measures of similarity, both structural similarity and uh, also sequence similarity. And the question is, why do those structures look so much alike? And for the sequences that are share significant similarity, why do those sequences look so much alike? And the answer is, I think the sort of the, the logical possibilities are they look alike because they're copies, because they've diverged from a common ancestor, or they look alike because they're convergent. Uh, organisms need serine proteases, and if you would like to be a serine protease, this is the only way you can come to do it. So clearly the first ex explanation, that these proteins are copies, that they are homologous, that they share a common ancestor, is the simpler of the two explanations. So when we see excess similarity, 
much more similarity than we would expect to see by chance. The simplest explanation for that, the most parsimonious explanation is that they're homologous, that they share a common ancestor. Um, that's the logic that is used to talk about the presence of proteins in organisms that last lived billions of years ago. And of course, the nice thing about using serine proteases in this example is that you can also show the, the, the alternative. Um, so here is uh, bovine trypsin again, and here we have a subtle isin. And these proteins, of course, have this very similar functions. They have very similar chemistry. They have an active site, which is very similar, the same catalytic triad. Yet, if you look at all the rest of the protein, and if you look at the overall level of uh, structural similarity or sequence similarity, um, there's no excess of similarity whatsoever outside of the active site. And so now if you ask the question again, what would be easier, to make these two proteins from a copy of something, or to make these two proteins where one of them simply arises in independently, then the second alternative, the independent um, emergence of the protein, seems like the simpler uh, possibility. So, still using the argument from parsimony, you would say that these two uh, proteins, because they look so different everywhere except in the active site, the simplest explanation is that they arose independently, that they are analogous or the result of convergent evolution. So, the whole idea of inferring homology is all about statistical significance. If we see much more similarity than we would expect to see by chance, then we infer homology as the most parsimonious explanation. Alternatively, if there's not a lot of excess similarity, then we have to at least entertain the possibility that those the two uh, sequences or structures that we're looking at could have arisen independently from completely different origins. Um, so the sort of foundation for inferring homology from statistical significance has to do with uh, this statement right here, that unrelated sequences have scores which are indistinguishable from random sequences. So I'm going to show you a couple of slides to demonstrate that. Um, there's certainly lots of work that's been done in a number of different groups that make this um, abundantly clear. There's really no question that this is true for sequence comparison. So one of the ways that we know this is by simply sort of looking at the distribution of scores when you do a similarity search. The wonderful thing about SwissProt for people like me who care about similarity statistics is every time you do a SwissProt search, there are 150,000 scores from sequences which are almost certainly unrelated. So we have lots of controls. So in this uh, slide, what I'm showing you is the results of a search where I'm, I'm giving you the distribution of scores for the search. The boxes are the scores from real proteins against other real proteins. This actually was a search of SwissProt. Um, and the line is simply showing you the expected distribution of scores um, from simply knowing the size of the database. If you tell me the size of the database and I calculate my scores in a way which is appropriately normalized, I can predict extremely accurately exactly how the scores are going to be. So that is something which um, certainly we rely on every day, but it's not something that is sort of immediately obvious. Because if you think about the number of proteins in Swiss Pro, 150,000 or so, um, and you think about um, the fact that those proteins live in real organisms, they're constrained to fold, they're constrained to have an active site, they're constrained to um, have some kind of a useful function. Um, the 150,000 proteins in Swiss code are a enormously, uh, enormously is not the right word, a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of all possible proteins. So you could certainly imagine that proteins that fold and proteins that have a function would not be uniformly distributed in protein sequence space, that they might be in some little corner of the space where living proteins can be, which is different from the rest of space. But in fact, the line here is giving us the distribution from um, the entire space. It's simply mathematically random proteins. So the fact that the real proteins look like um, mathematically random proteins can also tell us something about what possible, the possibilities for proteins. So here's sort of the fundamental theorem for sequence similarity searching, which is that unrelated sequences have similarity scores that are indistinguishable from random sequences. If a similarity is not random, then it must be not unrelated. So when we see something that's statistically significant, we infer that those sequences are related, that they share a common ancestor, that they're homologous. Um, here's another quick plot that shows you the results from doing lots of similarity searches. And because I don't have, I'm sort of run out of time here, I'll just point out that when the 
symbols here lie on top of this diagonal line. That simply says that the statistics are extremely accurate. And as I said before, this has been demonstrated for dozens and dozens and actually hundreds and hundreds of proteins, proteins where the issue of, of homology is, is well understood because we actually know the structures and proteins, larger sets of proteins as well. So um, for sequence comparison, um, it's clear that this is true, that real unrelated sequences have similarity scores that are indistinguishable from random sequences. The question then becomes, is this also true for structure comparison? Because, of course, we'd like to use structure comparison as our gold standard. And um, that then implies or raises the question as to whether or not there really are. We can talk about random sequences. Does it make sense to talk about random structures? So um, I'll just show you one example, again, with the serine proteases of some issues as far as establishing homology versus um, uh, convergence for um, a protein family. Again, the serine proteases. So these three proteins are, um, everyone agrees that they're homologous. If you look in both SCOP and CAF, um, they're classified as the same uh, family or homology class in, in CAF. Uh, in contrast, this viral protease, it's not clear, and it's not classified consistently, so that CAF would say that this is in a different topology class, so that it might actually have a different ancestry and look similar only because of convergence, whereas Scott places this protein in the same um, superfamily as bovine trypsin and Escherichia's trypsin. And then finally, we have subtilisin, which is clearly a result of convergence. So the question is, do we have quantitative methods that allow us to, to sort of understand where do we put this viral protease? And the problem really is that we don't. So what I'm showing you here are the results from Dolly uh, structure comparisons, vast structure comparisons, COMPASS, which is a profile-profile comparison method, CyBlast, and S-Search. And I'll just say that for uh, CyBlast and S-Search, which are sequence-based methods, they have no problem in establishing the similarity with Escherichia's trypsin, and they both fail to, to um, es establish the similarity with Escherichia's protease A, which is clearly um, similar based on significant structural similarity, either using Dolly or also uh, using VAST. When you get here to the vi viral protease, it's certainly very marginal from the Dolly perspective, and VAST is not able to detect statistically significant structural similarity. And then, of course, for unrelated things, it's unclear as well. So it's not exactly clear what to do about uh, for structure comparison because structure comparison is so much more difficult. It's difficult um, partly because of the fact that structures are not unique. We can talk about two sequences as being 100% identical, but two structures for exactly the same protein need not be exactly identical. And in fact, they can differ by more than 1.5 angstroms RMSD. We also don't have an optimal alignment algorithm and we don't understand the statistics, so we really don't have a sense of what to expect from random structures. So it's much more difficult for structures comparison to decide whether or not you're looking at some similarity which is the result of homology or the result of simply random chance of convergence to a somewhat similar structure. Um, so here's a graph that sort of shows how well different kinds of comparison methods do, and the simple thing to do is to just look at this bar right here these are four different ways of, of sort of ranking the efficiency of different methods. So this is S-Search, a Smith-Waterman algorithm. This is CyBlast. The fact that there's this difference here says that CyBlast is able to recognize about twice as many homologs as S-Search is. And over here is Dolly, which manages to recognize about twice as many uh, homologs as, um, as CyBlast does. And I'll just say that the fact that these other two methods, COMPASS and VAST, have these little lines that jump up and down simply reflects the fact that their statistical estimates are not very reliable. Here's another way of looking at it. This is another plot of this a kind of a QQ plot. It says how often you expect to get um, an, a non-topolog. So the fact that uh, this is S-Search, which is barely visible there along the diagonal line, says that its statistics are extremely accurate. Lines which are below the diagonal lines say that the statistical estimates are overestimates. So we're telling you that something is only going to happen one time in a thousand when actually it will happen one time in a hundred by chance. So Cyblast and Dolly have very similar um, sort of uh, statistical inaccuracies. They're off by about a factor of ten. And Vast and Compass are far, far uh, less accurate so that they will tell you that things um, have a statistical significance of ten to the minus. Uh, tenth, when in fact it's something that could happen by chance. Um, 
So um, it just turns out then that for uh, structure comparison, it's not clear that unrelated sequences always have random structural similarity, um, but the bias in the field certainly um, takes the fact that the, the, these things may not be random to be used to infer ancient domain homologies, and there's a strong bias to, inf to make that kind of inference as opposed to talking about convergence or multiple independent origins. Dolly produces pretty accurate estimates, however, so you can imagine that there would be ways of doing structure comparison that are statistically more accurate. Um, so the last thing I want to talk about, which I have to talk about very quickly because I'm running out of time, is how often new things might happen, or sort of from a more grandiose perspective, how big is the universe of protein sequences that can actually fold into functional structures? So I'm going to very quickly show you two examples where you have different structures for exactly the same uh, function. So here's bovine trypsin and subtle lysin, uh, which we've talked about a bunch. Clearly, these two um, proteins arose independently, despite the fact that they have similar functions. Um, here's another example, and it's only a part of the example because there are a couple of, uh, so there are five, four or five uh, clearly distinct glutathione transferase families. Um, here's the sort of best known family. Here's another family which looks completely different. This one looks somewhat similar, but in fact doesn't share statistically significant structural or st uh, sequence similarity. And then there's another family, which I don't have, a st the, the structure is not known, but it's a um, microsomal protein whose structure is dramatically different from what is known about it from these proteins. So again, at least four times uh, glutathione transferase activity has emerged, and it turns out that homologs of these glutathione transferases are present in animals and plants and bacteria, so that those four emergences must have taken place a very, very long time ago. So um, we've got subtilisin and trypsin. We've got glutathione transferases. Of course, we also have lots of examples of non-orthologous displacement, where you have a, a pathway in an organism which is now being catalyzed by a non-homolog. Um, and so I'm going to argue that, in fact, um, as we look at it more and more, we're going to find lots of examples of functions that are, are recreated frequently in nature that have arisen independently. So the last thing I want to talk about very quickly is the question of whether or not protein sequences are random. So one of the ways of recognizing that they seem to be random is by the fact that similarity statistics work. If protein sequences didn't look random, then local similarity scores would not be as, uh, the statistical estimates would not be as accurate as they are. But uh, another way to do it, which is certainly much more sensitive, is to talk about the frequency of different words in proteins. So one of my graduate students, Dan Laval, has been simply counting the number of times lot different, the 160,000 four-letter words uh, or four amino acid words take place in proteins and asking the question, can real proteins be distinguished from random proteins based on uh, their oligopeptide or word counts? And um, so we've, when you do this, it's very important that you um, develop a non-redundant set of proteins because protein families certainly have their preferred um, word, uh, per, uh, four-letter word preferences. So you have to make sure that when you're sampling things, you sample each protein family only once. And that's what we've done. And here's a plot of, of the expected number of four-letter words versus the observed number of four-letter words. When you see things in color here, what that shows is that um, things are overrepresented. Um, but in fact, the reason that they're overrepresented is because they're low complexity. So we have a measure of the complexity of a word. And so we have words that are the four, same amino acid four times, three and one, two and two, and so on and so forth. And of our um, overrepresented words, only 661 of the 116,000 possible four letter words where all four letters are different are actually overrepresented. So it's less than 1%. And if you take the, these two categories together, it's only about 4% of four letter words. So the, the answer is that, in fact, it is not possible to distinguish between real protein sequences and random sequences simply based on the composition of four-letter words. The, the, the other uh, things that are being shown here is the composition of words if you don't just take each letter adjacent, but you take letter one, letter three, letter five, and letter seven. So that's actually something which is large enough to find to, to um, form a structure of um, So... Are protein sequences random? The answer is, by and large, yes, they are. Um, so to summarize, um, of course, the main thing that I want you to always remember is that 
uh, statistical significance estimates are very uh, accurate. Um, and the reason they're accurate, though, is because unrelated sequences behave like random sequences. If you're not random, the simplest explanation, the most parsimonious explanation is that you're homologous. Um, protein structure comparisons can identify additional homologs, but they have serious issues with statistical significance. They have very high false positive rates. If the question is, um, do you see excess similarity in proteins that appear to have arisen independently? Um, as a result, structures to comparison methods are very uh, unreliable. But it may turn out that protein structures are, in fact, random. Um, um, it certainly it seems to be the case that new structures with similar functions appear frequently, and the distribution of protein words that are random. And long domains, and I didn't talk about this last thing, but it turns out that there are also lots of ancient long domains. So again, here's the number from uh, Amos from Monday, uh, the number of proteins that might be present in organisms on Earth. Here's the number of proteins that you could might imagine, simply 20 to the average length of a protein. And um, that is such a tiny fraction that it's very difficult, I think for me at least, to imagine that the proteins on Earth are even a, you know, 1% of all the possible proteins that could fold, which just means that there are enormous numbers of other possible proteins. And I'll give you a quick slide of the people who did the work. So the structure comparison was done by Mike Sirk, and the word count stuff was done by Dan Laval. Thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for questions. Please, the microphone here. Can I? You're waiting for a question? I can. Okay, but just a small question regarding the randomness of um, uh, protein sequences. Have you tried to compare the autocorrelation function of uh, protein to that of random sequences? Sorry? I didn't hear the entire question. Oh, okay. So I said, uh, have you tried to compare the autocorrelation function of real protein sequence with that of random sequences? Oh. Um, we have not done that. And, and I guess um, I can imagine two results. I actually skipped over the slide kind of quickly just a second. So if you look at um, bulk sets of protein sequences, all of Swiss protein, all of humans, all of any bacteria, the word counts are extremely biased. The reason the word counts are extremely biased is because different organisms expand different families of proteins. And families of proteins have their own word biases. So I guess I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if you did the autocorrelation kind of analysis that um, you would see something on a large sets of proteins that would go away when you um, look at um, um, one protein family only gets counted one time. So in some sense, some of the autocorrelation stuff might have appeared from the, the studies where we did where we didn't just look at adjacent four letters. We would look at one, three, five, seven, or one, four, space by two, or space, space by one, two, or three. And we don't see any difference doing it that way as opposed to looking at adjacent letters. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a microphone. Maybe I'll jump in. Hello? Oh, yes. Yeah. Shall I ask? I have a mic. Uh, shall, shall I go first? So, 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 uh, uh, so, so I have a question about uh, your thoughts on, uh, on, on similarity measures uh, between two proteins. So, so, so all of the, all of the, the, the standard discussion uh, about similarity of sequences occurs in terms of aligned sequences and then a letter-by-letter -letter comparison of similarities. And typically, similarity is added up as a sum over pairwise single letter scores. And as you're well aware, one might do other things. So my question is whether you, whether, whether you have looked at or you think it's worth looking at similarity measures that generalize beyond the single residue uh, uh, summed over all positions uh, measure, and perhaps would capture evolutionary similarities or other similarities better for the purposes of the questions which you very well described. So for example, you might have a residue that in evolution shifts position by one while the rest doesn't. 
or the role, functional role of a residue that gets split between two adjacent residues or whatever. So, so I wonder whether you think it's worth looking at that and what your thoughts are on that. So uh, we haven't done that. That's, that's the easy, easy answer to the question. Um, I think as you, it's very helpful to have a specific question in mind before one develops additional methods for making measures. And clearly, traditional sequence alignment, whether it's pairs of sequences or profiles or something like that, is by far the most effective way of extracting in evolutionary information, homology information from sequences. All the other ways that I know about um, really pale in comparison to, to conventional sequence alignment. And that kind of, of method is the one I think that maps the most effectively onto what predicting whether or not proteins are likely to have the same structure. So um, we haven't done it, and my prediction, I guess, so in some sense, the, the word counts that we've done is a different way of, of thinking about similarity. And what that says is that if you're looking at different families, it's all going to look different. In fact, it's simply going to look like chance. That one protein family is completely in a different space or a different part of the space than uh, another protein. So I don't think it's going to work that way. So uh, we don't do that. I'm just one more. Excellent. Short question. Excellent talk, Bill. Um, we have no question the sequence similarity is much more accurate when you uh, consider mostly uh, false positives. But what about the false negatives? If they're given equal weight, how do the two compare with accuracy? If accuracy is defined equally for false negatives and false positives. So, so many false I, I, negatives. I think I, it's hard to talk about um, uh, when I think about homology and sequence similarity searching. I guess I have to not think about false positives because I don't um, false negatives. Know, false false negatives. I'm sorry. I care, I care a lot about false positives, and of course, the reason we do for sequences is because there are so many sequences that there are lots of chances to get false positives if you don't get the statistics right, and so. I think in the field, we've sort of given up on the false negatives, except that we develop methods like psi blasts and other kinds of things that try to reduce the number of false negatives. So I showed you in the, one of the last slides the difference between the performance of psi blast and Dolly. And of course, I would love to have a method which, um, a sequence based method that would perform as well as Dolly and gave the same level of low level of false positives that uh, Smith Waterman does. And that's certainly a goal. Um, so there's room for improvement, so I won't, guess I won't say we should give up, but I think false positives, at least from a biological perspective, are much more damaging. Because you really don't like your students going off and trying to, to work on something that's not real. I think we have to stop this interesting discussion, but uh, you are available at the coffee break. <laughs> <laughs>